Fish in a Tree by Linda Mulally Hunt. Chapter 9. Bag Full of Nothing. Today we're supposed to bring in something that represents us and tells the class about it. I thought of a few things I could bring, like a can full of dirt or a bag full of nothing. Mr. Daniels asks for volunteers to go first. Shock of the century when Shay raises her hand. She gets up there with a picture of her horse, Diamond. She goes on about how she loves him and goes riding several times a week, but how it's a lot of work to take care of him. She shows us her riding helmet and fancy riding jacket, too. I guess there really isn't anything that she doesn't have. Jessica brings a picture of Shay and talks about what good friends they are, which I think is funny since we're supposed to talk about ourselves. Oliver bounces to the front of the room. His feet are never on the floor at the same time. He takes out a light bulb. I am the giver of light. Really? Mr. Daniels asks. Well, my dad is. He sells lamps. And when I grow up, I'm going to be a salesman too. I'm going to sell hangers. Hangers? Mr. Daniels asks. Yeah, because I was thinking that it should be something that everybody has, but you'd want to sell stuff that most people need because if you sold stuff that nobody wanted, then you wouldn't sell anything, right? And everybody needs hangers. Mr. Daniel smiles and puts his hand on Oliver's shoulder. Oliver, you are one clever boy, you know that? I haven't been in this school that long, but I'm going to guess that Oliver hasn't heard that said much. He falls into his chair, which tips back, but he grabs his desk, writes himself, and cheers for his own victory. Albert gets up next. As always, he wears the shirt with flint on it and his bruises. He reaches into a brown paper lunch bag and pulls out a jar of clear liquid. He clears his throat. This is a mixture of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen molecules. Will it explode? Yells Oliver. Albert does not answer. Instead, he unscrews the metal lid and drinks whatever it is. I'm silently freaked out, but Oliver goes nuts. He drank it. Did you see that? He drank molecules. Gross. It is merely water, Albert reports. While Mr. Daniels speaks to Albert, Shay whispers to Jessica. Water? Really? That's all he's got? Shay has gotten even better at being mean. Ever since Mr. Daniels kept her in for recess for making fun of Oliver, she saves her comments for when Mr. Daniels is busy or talking to someone else. This water was taken from a giant underground lake that goes on for miles and miles, Albert announces. It's the same water that the dinosaurs walked through a hundred million years ago and the cavemen drank. It's the same water that polar bears swam in just last year and medieval knights guzzled after battle. Oliver and most of the other boys stand, trying to get a better look. That's cool, Albert, Max says. Where did you get it? Jessica and Shay smile and lean forward to look at Max. Shay calls out, yeah, Albert, where did you get it? I got it from my kitchen faucet. Huh? The same water has been here and been reused since the earth began. It is important to me because, as a scientist and historian, I know that we are but a blip on the Earth's timeline, a grain of sand on an entire beach of time. Kids are starting to groan. Here goes the professor again, Max says. Yeah, such a show-off, Jessica says, turning to Max. Now, knock that off, Mr. Daniel says. I think Albert's idea is fascinating, how Earth has recycled its water over and over. Extraordinary, Albert. Next, he calls on Keisha. She carries a small box and holds it like whatever is inside will break easily. When she takes out a cupcake, the boys argue about who will get to eat it. This is a cupcake that I made. It isn't from a box mix. It's homemade. And why is it important to you? Mr. Daniels asks. I like to bake. I told my mom I want to start a business when I get older, and she said there's no time like the present. So this is the first one I'll show to anyone outside my family. My God, Shay whispers. She acts like she's the first to make a cupcake. It's not even decorated or anything. Shay, please keep your comments constructive, Mr. Daniels says. Yes, it is plain on the outside, Keisha says, half smiling at Shay. But it's the inside that matters. Keisha takes the knife out of her box and cuts the cupcake in half and shows us the inside. As you can see, it says yum on the inside. How did you do that? Suki asks, and I'm surprised to hear her talk. She hardly ever says anything. 
I've been experimenting with making letters out of different kinds of dough. I stand the letters up in the cupcake batter and carefully cover them with more batter. Do you lick the spoon when you're done? Oliver asks. I like to lick the spoon, but my mom says too much sugar isn't good for me, so she doesn't bake much because Oliver, Mr. Daniel says, pulling on his own ear. Oliver stops right away. Then Mr. Daniels looks at the cupcake. Wow, Keisha, that is pretty impressive. I'm going to call my baking business Hidden Messages, the batter way to send a note. That's fantastic, Keisha, Mr. Daniels says. The possibilities are infinite. Albert raises his hand and Mr. Daniels points to him. The possibilities are not, in fact, infinite, as she would eventually run out of appropriate letter combinations and the number of letters to be used in each cake would be limited as well. Also, you imply that the possibilities are all positive when it is probable that the possibilities would be equal in positive and negative outcomes. Actually, you are correct, Albert, Mr. Daniels says, but I am an optimist. What can I say? So you agree that the possibilities aren't endless? Well, I agree from a mathematical standpoint, Albert, but not from a human one. I believe that the things we put numbers on are not necessarily the things we can count the most. You can't measure the stuff that makes us human, like Keisha's creativity or how hard she'll work, Mr. Daniel shrugs. Just my opinion. Well, it seems that the part that can be measured is most important, Albert says, because that's what can be proven. Well, my fine young fellow, I think we'll have to agree to disagree, Mr. Daniel says, walking by Albert and patting his shoulder. Then Mr. Daniels calls on Suki. She pulls out tiny paper bags and begins to pass them out to everyone. I bring two foods to share. One is Hone sin Sinbai, my grandfather recipe. Other is wasabi peas. They are maybe spicy. Food in America tastes. She turns to Mr. Daniels. What is correct word? All of a sudden, Max jumps up and runs to the sink, followed by Keisha and Jessica. Too hot, Max yells. The three push each other a bit, trying to scoop water into their mouths. Ah, yes, Suki continues. Bland is correct word. Food here is bland. She seems to think that the three kids at the sink are both funny and odd. I think how hard it would be to move to a different country and have to learn another language. I can't even handle one. Mr. Daniels laughs, holding the little bumpy bright green pea between his fingers. They don't look that hot. Most people in the class are too chicken to eat it now, pushing it away. Suki looks a little hurt. Albert puts one in his mouth. He eats it, but looks like he's in pain. His eyes even water. He says with a gasp, I like it, Suki. Thank you. That Albert is nice. Oliver pops his in his mouth, but has no reaction. Oliver, Mr. Daniels asks, you don't think it's hot? Nah, I'm the only one in my family that can finish a fireball without taking it out of my mouth. My mother says I must have no taste buds at all, and my dad says, Mr. Daniels pulls on his earlobe again and says, thanks, Oliver. Oliver's mouth is open, ready to keep going, but he says, thanks, Mr. Daniels. Do they have some signal or something? Suki continues, these Foods mean much to me because I share them with my grandfather. Many things about Japan I miss, but grandfather I most miss. Also, I miss wood carving with him. He make me wooden blocks and I carve gift for him and send. So that's why she has those blocks. I eat these foods because they remind me of Japan and my grandfather. I feel sad for her. What are the crackers made of? asks Albert. Suki turns to him. They are made of shrimp and fish bones. It isn't just Oliver who goes wild over that one. Most everyone says, yuck. And Suki looks up at Mr. Daniels, who turns to the class. Now, now, quiet down. Shrimp and fish bones, Shay asks. We prefer lobster in our family. Albert raises his hand. I would just like to point out that lobster is a very expensive meal now, but in the olden days, it was served only to peasants and slaves who revolted and demanded that they only be served lobster twice a week. And, he swallows, I think fish bones would have some excellent nutritional properties. Suki smiles for a second before she scurries back to her seat. Mr. Daniels gives Albert a solid nod. Next, it's my turn. What I ended up bringing in means something to me, but now I'm not sure the class would be nice about it. I decide to play it safe and say I forgot. I can tell Mr. Daniels is disappointed. Well, then, do you have a pet you can tell us about? He asks. 
No, my mom is allergic. This reminds me of my dad crawling around the living room on all fours, pretending to be the puppy I begged for. Oliver starts to bark like a dog. Mr. Daniel says, too much of that, Oliver, and we'll have to give you dog biscuits. Better be careful. Mr. Daniel squints at me. Are you sure there's nothing you can show us? Because I have a feeling there's something. I slide my hand down into my pocket and clutch my 1943 steel penny, the object I brought in for sharing today. He watches my hand and I realize I've given myself away. So I stand and I take out the penny. My dad is in the army and he's deployed right now. On the day my dad left, he gave Travis and me these pennies. I look up at Mr. Daniels. That's my big brother. He nods. In 1943, pennies looked weird because they were silver in color like quarters. They were made of steel instead of copper because the government needed copper to make ammunition during World War II. Then in 1944, pennies went back to the usual red copper color. Anyway, I think it's cool. I do too, Mr. Daniels said. And I think it's even more cool that you told us about it. As I walk back to my seat, I think of how when dad left, he said that when we look at the steel pennies, we need to remember that we are unique too. And also that things will go back to normal for us, that he'll be home before we know it. I really miss him. Mr. Daniels gives Oliver a thumbs up. And I think how cool it is that they have the ear pulling signal. That way he doesn't always have to tell Oliver that he's doing something wrong in front of everyone. I know what that feels like, and I'm happy that Mr. Daniels cares so much. Most teachers seem like their students to be all the same, perfect and quiet. Mr. Daniels actually seems to like that we're different. Chapter 10. Promises, promises. All right, Fran fantasticos, Mr. Daniels says, rubbing his hands together like a mad scientist. First thing I'm going to do today is book talk. I will do that a lot this year tell you about some of my favorite stories. When Mr. Daniels talks about books, it reminds me of Max or Oliver, like he's ready to launch a giant party. I like hearing about the story, but asking me to read them would be like asking a lobster to play tennis. And then it gets worse. He holds up a pile of notebooks. I have a surprise. I have a brand new writing journal for each of you, which you will write in every day. Oh no, I'd rather eat grass. But here's the thing. I will sometimes give you a topic, but not very often. And I will never, ever, even if an evil sorcerer threatens to turn all my correcting pens to clear ink, correct your work. Huh? They will never be graded. They will never be corrected. And most days, I won't tell you what to write about. You may write about your life, sports, the country of Bulgaria, your favorite kind of soap, books you like, books you don't like, anything. Wow, I wonder if he's delirious. No correcting anything we want. This is too good to be true. I know something's coming. There are a only a couple of rules. Ah, there they are, the rules. You must put pencil to paper and do something. And I will often answer with a sentence or two. Right back, Oliver asks, can we grade you? Mr. Daniels laughs. We're not going to grade at all, Oliver. This is about communication, self-expression, not measurements. Can we ask you questions? Max asks. Sure, he says, passing out the notebooks. Mine is yellow, a little too nice a color for writing thing. Can I write about football? Max asks. Anything you want. This is going to be great, Oliver yells. I'm going to ask for answers to the test and extra recesses and unlimited ketchup in the cafeteria. Well, Mr. Daniels begins, as I said, you can ask whatever you want. He smiles at Oliver. So open up those notebooks now and add your first entry and make it you. This journal is yours. So an introduction to you may be a good thing, no matter how you choose to express that. Keisha begins writing while Albert stares at the blank page. The room is filled with the sounds of pencil scratching. Suki is rubbing one of her blocks with her thumb. I wonder if she's thinking about her grandfather. I see a mind movie of me walking through a forest of alphabet blocks stacked on top of each other. They sway like trees in the wind, and I worry that they will come crashing down on me. I think about drawing that, but decide to color a big three-dimensional cube with dark black sides. He said we could do anything. I want to see if he means it. The next day, Mr. Daniels holds my journal open to the page where I drew a, blank, drew a black cube. I figured he wouldn't let that go. He holds his palm facing me and says, 
I know, I know. I said I'd never correct you, and I'm not going to. I'm just wondering if you would mind telling me what this means. Do you like the color black, or does it mean something? Either way, it's okay. I think of the kinds of things that might make him mad and remember how he said a person can be too good at the wrong time, the wrong things. Maybe I don't want to get in trouble this time. It's a picture of a dark room. Oh, why would you draw a picture of a dark room? He looks serious now. It was supposed to be something about us. Why would a dark room have something to do with you, Allie? His voice is soft, really soft. I swallow hard. Because in a dark room, no one could see me. He stares down at my black cube, then he clears his throat before looking back up. Okay, thank you for being honest, Allie. I'm so relieved he isn't mad. Allie, he pauses. Can you tell me why you don't want to be seen? I think it would be easier to be invisible. Why? I shrug. I want to give him an answer but I have both too many words and not enough. He nods slowly. Well, he says, I'm glad you're not invisible, Allie, because this class wouldn't be the same without you. I don't believe him, but it makes me happy he said it. I realize looking at him that all this time, I haven't been looking at teachers in the face. I've been staring into their stomachs while I sit at my desk and they tell me the things that are wrong with me. But now, on top of all those other big wishes that I carry around, I have one more. I want to impress Mr. Daniels with every tiny little piece of myself. I just want him to like me.